Hey everybody, my name is Eric Conley, I'm the Garrett County 4 H Youth Development Agent, and today I'm going to be talking to you all about the Leaf Collection Project. So I'm going to be going through the first year, the second year, the third year Leaf Collection Project, and talk a little bit about uh, all the different things that you need for that, materials that you'll need, the kind of the process that you'll have to go through, and then uh, talk a little bit about some resources that will be available to you all. Okay, so the first thing I want to uh, go through are the materials. So the First thing is, I'm gonna need something to press my leaves with, okay? That could be an old phone book like this. You could use newspaper. Generally, you wanna use newspaper without color on it, so you just wanna use uh, sections that are newspaper print, black and white. Or, if you wanna be real fancy, you can actually <clears throat> use a traditional leaf press like this one. The next thing you're gonna need is you're gonna need a three ring binder something that looks like this, and or a three ring folder uh, that can attach in here, okay? You're gonna need 10 pieces of card stock, all right? You'll need 10 sheet protectors, or if you have a laminator, you're gonna need uh, 10 laminating sheets. You're gonna need some resources to be able to identify your leaves. This is a great resource that we have here in Kentucky. This is FOR-1. This is a publication that is put out by uh, the Department of Forestry, um, or the Forestry Department at the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food, and Environment. This is a really great resource. It has some great pictures. It talks about the uses, has all of the scientific names in it, talks about the fruit and the leaves, and gives you a, a a great description of some of the trees that we have here in Kentucky, okay? Uh, and then, of course, the main thing that you're gonna wanna have is you're gonna wanna have leaves, okay? So these are cutouts, okay? And I thought I would work with these rather than uh, use traditional real leaves uh, like this. And this is actually a leaf that I pressed uh, almost four years ago, so it's still in pretty good shape and I could actually use this one uh, in a collection if I wanted to, all right? Uh, and then the last thing, well, you know, of course I missed one thing, is you're gonna need something to hold those leaves on the paper with if you are gonna be using anything other than uh, laminating sheets. So if you're using laminating sheets, you don't have to worry about it. But if you're using sheet protectors, traditional sheet protectors, you wanna make sure that you have maybe some clear or traditional Elmer's glue, or you have a glue stick, okay? So let's get started in the process. Uh, so the first thing that you're going to want to do is you want to have, uh, you want to go out and you want to collect 10 leaves. Now the project is very specific. So if you're doing the first year leaf collection project, it's 10 leaves. If you're doing the second year, it's 20 leaves. If you're doing the third year leaf collection project, it's 50 leaves. Now you don't want to collect any, well, you do want to collect a little bit more than that, but you don't want to put in your collection any more than what the requirements say. So if it says that you need 10 leaves in your collection, then you want to make sure that you put 10 leaves in there. That can be counted off on, so please make sure that you, uh, that you do it correctly. I always encourage that if I'm going to go out and I'm going to, and I'm taking a group out and we're going to collect leaves, I try and collect at least 15 different types of leaves because when you put them in the press, maybe something happens to it in the press, uh, maybe a, a little fold gets in there, and you wanna make sure that you have some extras that you can rely back on, okay? So, I've gone out, I've collected my leaves, and so I need to put them in press. So when I put them in press, there's a couple of ways that I can do that. I can use the newspaper, like I was talking about, and I can use a book, and so I take the newspaper, and I open that up and I take one of my leaves. I put that in, I wanna make sure that my leaf stays flat uh, and that it doesn't have any creases or bent edges or uh, bent lobes or anything like that. I'm gonna close that up and then what I wanna do is I wanna just stack books up on top of it. So, uh, and you can do, you can put 10 leaves in there, 10 press leaves, and then you wanna make sure that you stack them against a hard surface. Uh, what that is trying to do and what you're trying to do with any, uh, you know, with any leaf collection is you're, over time you're trying to draw that moisture out but still maintain uh, the greenness of it and also the uh, traditional shape of it, okay? So that's one way to do it. Also, if you have an old phone book, then you can use this 
and you can put your leaf in there just like that. And once again, you wanna make sure that you have things stacked on top of it that are gonna keep it pressed, all right? Or if you have a traditional leaf press, let me get these out of the way. So with a traditional leaf press, I'm gonna have two pieces of board, all right? So I'm gonna lay down my bottom piece. I have these pieces of cardboard, all right? that fit right in there. And then I have what is called blotter paper. So the newspaper or the uh, phone book are actually working as the blotter paper. And simply what that is, is it's drawing that moisture out while maintaining the integrity of the leaf, okay? So I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna take my leaf and I wanna put that right in the middle. And then I wanna put another piece of blotter paper right on top of that another piece of cardboard. And the question always comes up, well, what's the point of the cardboard? The cardboard, if you notice, it's, uh, it has ventilation in it or has holes in it. And so it allows circulation of air to move across it. And so that means that uh, as you get air moving across it, you're also, it's gonna dry out a little bit faster, okay? I'm gonna take my last piece of, uh, of flat wood here and I'm going to put it on top. And then I want to, I either take belts or I take straps, or I can just sit things on top of that so that it, it's working as a press, okay? So I'm gonna set that aside here, and through the magic of time, uh, let's say that it's two weeks later. A lot of people, the biggest mistake that we make with leaf collections is they think, I, I need to put it in there for a couple of days, after that it's gonna be fine. No, you want to leave a leaf in there for at least 10 days, if not 14 days. And if you can go longer than that, better, okay? Uh, and the reason that is, is because you want to allow all of that moisture to be drawn out uh, and it to remain flat so that when you get it out, you don't have to worry about it being flimsy or having any kind of moisture in it because when it does have moisture in it, it can set up with uh, f funguses and all kinds of really gross stuff. And so we've seen some crazy things at the state fair. So after I get them out, I'm going to take my, I've got a, a piece of cardstock and the easiest way to do this is to go ahead and pre-identify your leaves. So you're gonna need really five different things, or I'm sorry, six different things on your um, collection label. On that collection label, and I'm gonna, I've got an example here, all right? On your collection label, which is always gonna be in the bottom right-hand corner, you're gonna have your common name, scientific name, common uses, county collected, date collected, and then the habitat. And we'll talk individually about each of those things as well. So after I've identified all my leaves, I've not glued anything, I've not done anything else, and you can do this in the time that the leaves are in the press. You can take a picture of them uh, or you can identify them as you collect them, but make sure that you do that beforehand. So then I take my cardstock and I can either write out or I can type out the names. Typing is a lot better because it's obviously going to be a little bit more legible, but if you don't have access to a computer or you can't print these out, then feel free to write them out. Just make sure that you follow the instructions and we'll go through that in just a moment. So I've got my cardboard or I've got my cardstock out. Uh, I've got my leaf and let me pull out one of the leaves. Okay. Well, what I did with it anyway. Uh, so I've got a leaf on here. And so I want to make sure that the leaf is completely vertical as long as it will fit on an eight and a half uh, by 11 sheet of paper. So I wanna make sure that it's vertical. If you have a larger leaf, maybe something like a pawpaw or one of the magnolias, one of our native magnolias, you may have to angle that across the page and that's totally okay, but this is traditionally how you wanna do it. You wanna make sure that it's vertical and it's right in the center of your sheet of paper, okay? So with this one, vertical sheet of paper, and then how I'm gonna put it on there. Like I said, if you're gonna laminate, uh, the laminate sheets or laminate sheets are going to look like this and so it's very easy. I don't have to put any glue. I don't have to put anything else on it. Uh, but if you're going to use glue sticks or you're going to use traditional Elmer's glue, then I strongly encourage that you, are, you have to be very gentle with the leaves because they'll be very fragile after they come out of the press for uh, a couple of weeks. What you want to do is you want to run the glue stick along 
the, the veins of the leaf. So if you look, you see the, the venation in the leaf here. So you wanna make sure that on the back of the leaf, and make sure you do it on the back of the leaf, you're going to run glue along the edge of the leaves. Now, with glue sticks, you don't have to worry about it nearly as much, but you still wanna make sure that you put a light, very, very light coating so that it's just gonna to stick to the paper and you wanna put that along the edge or along the vein and then along the edge so that it sticks to the paper. Uh, if you're using uh, liquid glue, then you need to be very careful about how much you put on. I always encourage using a small paintbrush and taking that paintbrush and gently painting along the veins, putting a very, very small amount because what will happen is if you put too much, it will glob up in a location and it'll soak into the leaves and you'll get these dark spots in your leaves. I encourage lamination, but that's only because it's a little bit easier uh, and uh, there's a few less steps that you have to do. So after you have finished gluing your leaves on there, if that's the route that you go, uh, and you are going to either uh, laminate the sheet or, and like I said, if you laminate, you don't necessarily need to, uh, but if you are using clear protected sheets, you can go ahead and put those in and you have your first collection page, okay? Now let's talk a little bit about the information that goes in the bottom right-hand corner, always the bottom right-hand corner, um, and I try and use just regular Times New Roman or Calibri font. I don't try and get fancy uh, because it is a scientific collection and you wanna make sure that all of the information you have there is accurate, okay? So let's talk a little bit about that. So on, um, on one of the resources that you'll get, it'll look like this, and it has a backside to it as well, but this goes through some of the things that you need to make sure that you watch out for. For common name, most of the trees that we have in Kentucky, the common name is gonna be all lowercase, unless it has a proper noun. So if it's an American beech, American obviously is gonna be capitalized, but if it's a sugar maple, sugar and maple all is going to be lowercase so please make sure that you follow that because that's one of the things that a lot of people slip up on and sometimes your computer will actually do that uh, and unintentionally it's just how it's programmed and so you want to make sure that you watch out for that so anything that doesn't have a proper noun in it should be all lowercase your scientific names please make sure that you look up and you need to use all native trees to Kentucky so um, there's 120 to 130 different species of trees in Kentucky so please make sure that you uh, that you use uh, all native trees on the scientific name though uh, you're going to either do it one of two ways you're going to uh, italicize it which that's going to be a lot easier if you type if you have typewritten all of your labels or if you're gonna handwrite them, the other way is to write out your scientific name and then underline it. Your first, the first word in your scientific name, which is the genus, needs to be capitalized. So for sugar maple, this example, the scientific name is Acer saccharum, okay? Acer is the genus, and that is gonna be capitalized, so capital A-C-E-R. And then the, the uh, epithet or the species name is saccharum, uh, S-A-C-C-H-A-R-U-M, and that one needs to be lowercase, all lowercase. So that's how it needs to be on the label. Uh, next, it says common uses. Please make sure that, and this book is great about the common uses, but please make sure that you find common uses. One of the biggest mistakes that we see is that people try and get real fancy and they, you know, sugar maple was used as um, bowling pins for Neanderthals 10 million years ago or whatever. Common uses. Make sure that it is a common use. All right. Uh, next is the county collected. This is really important because remember this is a scientific collection. So if you say, hey, I found this tree in this county, then, uh, then we should be able to come back and say, oh, you found it in that county, could you tell us where it's at? Not that that'll probably ever happen, but if somebody from, let's say, uh, nature preserves or uh, parks or somewhere, they found out that you found a tree that had never been seen in that particular county before, they're gonna wanna know some of the location information uh, for it. Uh, next is the date collected. Uh, the date collected, it only needs to be the month and the year. Do not put the date. 
month and the year only. So please make sure that you follow that. And then finally, habitat. Now this is one that always confuses people. This has a really good listing. This little publication has a great listing of the habitat where you find them. What happens a lot of times is people just want to put the location where they found it. So if they find the sugar maple, let's they put uh, grandma's backyard. Okay, well, grandma's backyard may be a really neat place, but it's not the traditional, typical habitat of that particular tree or that species of tree. So like this one says, moist, rich sites with well-drained soil. So this is one that you, um, uh, the habitat, make sure that you try and find the habitat that that species of tree typically grows in because that's what we're looking for here. So those are the six items that you need to make sure that you have down in the bottom right hand corner. Okay, so uh, on the back of that sheet uh, or on uh, the resources that I list, there's also going to be some additional things uh, and some common mistakes that are made. Misidentification of species, they use a non-native or an invasive species. Misspellings are very common, so please make sure that you check your spellings. And I usually try and do that in multiple resources uh, so that I know that I'm getting the best possible spelling or, or what I know is, is out there as a spelling. Leaf is in poor condition. When you collect leaves, you wanna make sure that you collect the best possible leaf that you can find. The one that is most typical of that type of tree and the one that has the least amount of damage, whether that be from wind or insects or anything. And the best time to collect is essentially now until the end of June. That's the best time for you to get out and collect. Um, turning in a leaflet for a compound leaf. I always encourage that in the first year you just use simple leaves. That means that you have um, one petiole or one leaf stalk at the bottom, but when you use compound leaves, that becomes a little bit confusing. So I would look up the differences between simple and compound leaves. Uh, the next one is uh, putting too much information for the date collected. Once again, only the month, only the year. Not giving the appropriate information for habitat. We talked about that. Don't put your grandmother's house or uh, the local park. Uh, make sure that you list the particular habitat. And then having more or less leaves than is required by the particular project. So make sure that you have 10 or 20 or 50, depending on the year project that you're doing. Now, I said in the beginning that I would collect 15 leaves if I'm doing a first year project. And the reason that is, is because you wanna make sure that you collect the best possible specimen and nothing happens to them when they're in the press, okay? So please make sure that you do that. Uh, some of the other resources, uh, this is just a real quick guide that is gonna be in the link that's gonna be at the end of this video. And then uh, I've also put the judges sheets that are on there. So you can actually look through and you can see the number of points that can be deducted or are available for your particular project. Uh, and then I'm also going to put in some of these, uh, some of these fake leads so that if you wanted to practice, you're more than welcome to do that. Okay. So uh, if you have any questions about the leaf collection project, feel free to contact me. My email address is uh, eric, E-R-I-C dot comley, C-O-M-L-E-Y at U-K-Y dot E-D-U, or you can also reach me on the Gary County 4-H Facebook page. Uh, I'm open to answer any questions, or if you need help with identification, please feel free to contact me, and I'll do the best that I can. Uh, thank you all very much, and this has been the Leaf Collection Project.